Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Many of you are here this morning. For those who weren't, my name is Aretha Blake, and I'm an attorney here in Charlotte. I'm the president of the Mecklenburg Bar Foundation, and former assistant dean here at the Charlotte School of Law, and a candidate for district court judge. So it is my pleasure to be here today to moderate this panel about social disparities. Uh, this morning, we shared some deep, in-depth discussion about dismantling racism. Um, and for those who are in that session, um, I encourage you to share with those who are not some of the learnings that you had. At the end, we talked a little bit about how we get the message out and start conversations beyond just a group of people in that room on the issues of implicit bias. Uh, so you have the power to do that because you have been empowered to do so uh, by beginning that knowledge. I encourage all of you to reach out and learn more about Race Matters and Juvenile Justice, uh, the organization I presented this morning, uh, and their program Dismantling Racism, which is a two-day workshop. I also know that there's going to be some work happening here at the law school on implicit bias, and I encourage you to be a part of that. This afternoon, we are talking about social disparities, and we have a panel of leaders from our community who are here to talk with you. We have one hour, now 55 minutes, and I'm going to keep on time because Edna is not going to get me. <laughs> so, I want to make sure that we maximize the time. So I'm not going to read their bios, uh, but I will just give you highlights. Uh, our first panelist to my right is Willie Ratchford. And Mr. Ratchford is the Executive Director of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Community Relations Committee. Um, he has had that position since I moved here 14 years ago, and I think he's been there how long, Mr. Ratchford? I had the position 26 years before you moved here. <laughs> <laughs> so, nothing else. He's experienced, but what I will tell you is that he knows his community. He knows a lot about the issues in his community. He also knows about the solutions and the possibility and the potential of this community. So he will bring great perspective with him um, from that regard. Next to him is Deputy Chief Vicki Foster, who is a 24-year veteran of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. And she is currently the Deputy Chief over Support Services. We then have Professor Fernando Nunez, who works here in the Immigration Clinic. Um, many of you know him. Um, he brings with him a wealth of experience in the areas of immigration law, um, and many of you hopefully have taken the clinic in immigration law. He would bring some good perspective for us with disparities dealing with uh, immigration issues and representation in legal systems. And to his left is the uh, general counsel of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, George Battle III. Uh, Mr. Battle has great experience both in health care as well as in education. And so he will bring that perspective to us today as we address some of the questions that you have posed. At lunch, you developed about 40 questions, it looks like, for us to start going through during this conversation. And there are some cards available if any new questions arise. Now, we'll say with our time indications, we may not be able to address them all. And so be patient with us. We're trying to hit as many as we can. But we want to talk about our community, where we are, and where we're going. So I will start with, for the panel generally, what are the most common biases you see in your field of work? Ladies first. Um, well, I guess first I should say I am probably not the most politically correct person ever, so you will see that <coughs> shortly. Um, I'm pretty blunt and answer things pretty directly. Um, in my field of work, I think um, primarily it is people not understanding the, the plight of other groups of people, and in particular, can you all hear, hear? can you hear this better? Okay. Um, in particularly different uh, various groups of people that maybe they have not grown up with, not lived in the same neighborhoods, and sometimes don't understand the plight and the struggles of other people. And so sometimes you see a lack of sensitivity because people don't understand why people are either in public housing and the whole family is in public housing and just various different different things. So I see it in what I do a lot. Um, it's just a lack of understanding of, of where people are, why they are, where they are, um, the opportunities that they may not have had, that they have had. And so sometimes people don't have, this, um, they're not as sensitive to, to that. If, if I'm right, uh add to what uh, Deputy Chief Foster has actually said, and I'm, I'm going to take a little uh, different approach uh, uh, to, this, to this question, uh, because um, I think in order to truly understand the conversation from the panel today, you need to, you need to understand exactly how uh, implicit or unconscious bias um, actually works. And I'm going to 
take just a quick minute to tell what I call my Costco story that some of you in here may have heard before. Uh, some months ago, my wife came home one day and she presented me with my Costco card. Uh, and as a man, I found out that one of the uh, uh, great things about Costco is that you can purchase gasoline uh, for like 20 to 25 cents a gallon cheaper at Costco than uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the gas station. Uh, when you buy gas at Costco, you put your Costco card into the pump. Uh, you then are asked to produce a credit card to purchase for your gasoline, and you purchase your gas, and you get a receipt. Now, the only way you can buy the gas is that you have to have a Costco card. So on this particular Saturday, I finish purchasing gas, and I go into Costco, and there's a middle-aged white female standing at the door, and she says, hi, welcome to Costco. And I said, well, it's good to be here. And she said, I'll need to see your Costco card. So I said, well, I just finished buying gas, and uh, in order to buy gas, I have to have a Costco card, so my receipt should suffice. And she said, oh, no, sir, I have to see your card. I said, are you sure? She said, sir, that's the policy. You can only come into Costco if we see your card. I said, fine. I'm going into my pocket to get my card, and this white guy runs up from behind me, and he stands in between she and I, and he says to her, my wife is in there somewhere, and I don't have a card. And she said, well, go right on in. <laughs> so I said, well, good, I, I won't need my car. She said, oh, no, sir, the policy is that you have to have your car. And I said, well, that seems sort of racist or discriminatory to me. And she became very upset that, that I had called her racist, almost to the point of tears. And she kept saying, so you're going to go there, you're going to go there. So I got closer to her because I wanted to explain what had just happened between she and this guy and myself, and I wanted to see her eyes. <clears throat> I explained it to her. And I'm looking in her eyes, and nothing is registered. And I feel myself getting increasingly frustrated, and I'm about this close to going into Black Panther mode. <laughs> and I realized she literally had no idea of what she had done, because with implicit bias or uh, unconscious bias, for her, the treatment of people of, of color in that way is so normal, so common, so every day, that you do it, and you literally have no idea that you treated the person different, because it's normal. I finally looked at her and I said, ma'am, I mean no harm and I mean no disrespect, but I'm going into Costco and you will not see my car. So I walk into Costco and as I'm walking, I see the man is just walking up to the show because someone has alerted them that this black guy is over here giving you a white woman a hard time. And so uh, I turn around and I give them my best Black Panther look and I see them pointing me out to them. And they looked at me and they said, if we go over there, it's going to be ugly. So they said, sir, go right on in. <laughs> but that, that's the way it's happened. And we'll talk more about this and others a little later. But I want to give you some sense to understand implicit or unconscious bias. Can you repeat the question just once more? What are the most common biases you see in your field of work? And I don't have much to add uh, to what Vicki or, or Willie said. I think it is, you know, in my work and working for a school district, um, you see bias in different places. The most common, of course, is in the classroom, but you also uh, see it in employment relationships. And I think it is a failure or an inability, uh, for the most part, to understand the cultural differences, to understand and be able to relate to people from different backgrounds, uh, be it by race or be it by economics. Um, generally it's a, you know, and with any kind of business, uh, the objective is to, you know, get done the main point of the business. So a lot of the relational parts of it are skipped or given short shrift. Um, up until recently, school districts <coughs> did not focus on training employees to deal with folks of different cultures. There was one way to teach, there was one way to manage, and that was it. Um, now, thankfully, uh, we're coming out of those uh, dark ages and starting to be more sensitive, uh, starting to look at things like the disparity in long-term suspensions between African Americans, his Latino Americans, and other groups, um, starting to look at rates in which employees are disciplined for different things. Um, so I, I don't have much more to add than that, but I think it's basically a failure to understand more so than any malice or ill will. Now, certainly there are those situations, um, but the majority is just you know, failure to understand each other and to be able to relate. Well, in, from my perspective, uh, I haven't 
I'm an immigrant and an immigration attorney at the same time. So initially, when I started practicing, I was construed as the immigrant coming into court as opposed to the attorney representing the immigrant. So I had to kind of make sure that I wore a tie to convey that, okay, I'm the, the attorney as opposed to the, you know, the individual. And I, even to this day, I teach it that you know, it's critical to convey that you are the attorney, despite the fact that you know, I have an accent and all these issues. Well, so that from, I kind of grown into that role as I get gray hair, then it's, you know, maybe it's you know, come across as I know what I'm talking about. Whether or not I do is different. Um, and then in, in the immigrant society, you know, I think that it's, you know, we, uh, depending on where you come in the States, you will, one thing that will distinguish you is the, the accent that you have, that you carry. So I, I think that we find that immigrants, despite being the fab, part of the fabric of the United States, they're not acknowledged as such. And then you know you have to demonstrate that no, you in fact love this country. In fact, you love the United States, and that, and the, in many respects, you find that uh, you need to kind of like demonstrate almost on a regular basis that in fact you are part of the fabric. You know, when when they ask you, where are you from? Well, Florida. No, no. Where are you from? Well, I came back from New York. Well, where are you from? Like, okay, they really, you know, I'm from here. You know, and you know, and and. Finding that it's kind of difficult at times to, to deal with because you may encounter even at this stage of where I spend most of my life here that whoa you know I just still have to justify my existence and and so do my clients so I think that I encounter on a regular basis and it's a matter of educating people and you know realizing that that's you know we are part of the fabric even though we're immigrants. I had a follow-up question. Um, the question I that came with the card is. How are you bringing the community together to address issues of social disparity that you identified? So I want to follow up particularly with Mr. Battle. Earlier in the first presentation um, <coughs> presented by RMJJ, we saw a couple slides about the disproportionate um, rate of suspensions and expulsion. And you mentioned that in your comment. So I want just some more information if you could share it with the group about what the school district is doing to address the data that clearly shows that there is some disproportionality there. Um, one, and perhaps some disparate impact, arguably, it's oh, probably absolutely. definitely. Um, there's some disparate impact there uh, on that issue. And then secondly, with respect to the work and the studies that's been done about opportunity in Charlotte. Um, and I don't know if everyone has seen the work of this opportunity task force based on a report that talked about um, the top 50 urban cities and Charlotte ranked 50 out of 50 when it came to opportunities, the ability to go from one level to another generation, leaves a 30 year study, uh, or 82, 80 to 82 to you know, 2012, 2010, 2012, so that's 30 years. And so we studied and we ranked 50. And one thing I noticed looking at all the maps is that they almost perfectly lay on top of each other when it came to the breakdown of educational performance over wealth, over race. There is some correlation there. And so knowing that, what work is the school district doing to impact what you control, which would be educational outcomes? So actually, the first part first, um, in terms of addressing racial disparities, um, outcomes specifically around discipline, the first thing that the school system has done, this will sound small, but it's huge, is actually acknowledge the problem. Uh, acknowledge that you know certain kids just aren't bad and that it's not just the kids fault or that it's not just external factors but there is a gap uh, in terms of the knowledge of our employees our teachers our principals our assistant principals who are with these kids uh, there's a divide there's a gulf in terms of understanding where they come from and how to appropriately address them uh, one of the second things is to get involved in groups like RMJJ. So school district, uh, CMS from the very beginning uh, has been involved in RMJJ. Uh, in fact, I think I was part of the first uh, class to take the uh, initial training, uh, which was in Greensboro. Um, the, and as part of that, uh, there's a conscious effort and there've been dollars put behind training employees at every level. So from supervisory level down to classroom assistants, cafeteria workers, custodians, 
everyone who will touch the lives of a kid to, to help that understanding. Um, the more practical, the, the more immediate impact has been looking at policies and practices and revising those. Um, because some had not been looked at in years and some just didn't make any sense. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the things that you could get suspended for at CMS up until about four years ago was skipping school. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to suspend a kid who's already <laughs> skipping school. Uh, so looking at that, changing that makes a lot of sense. The other thing is more of a national phenomenon that you see in school districts. In the 90s, along with the whole crackdown on crime, school systems adopted zero tolerance. So you do anything, you're out. Now we found, as with the criminal justice system, that that does not work. Uh, so the work is now into figuring out ways to keep kids in the classroom. Um, certainly there are certain things that you can't accommodate, uh, weapons, uh, you know, gangs, drug, but there are a lot of other things that you can accommodate if you try and if you're intentional about it. Uh, so those are a few things that are being done and looked at. But the second part of your question, um, what is the school system doing to address the, the economic uh, gap that we saw in the, I think it was the Berkeley, Cal Berkeley Harvard study that showed we were, Charlotte is a city where you're least likely to move from poverty into the middle class, not even wealth, but the middle class uh, among big cities in the country. Um, one of the things I think we operate under as a country, we, we operate under the myth that what happens in seven hours a day in the schoolhouse can overcome what happens in the other 17. So we've turned our schools by and large into not just places of education, but also mental health clinics, um, you know, feeding stations, uh, medical care, you know, everything, every um, thing that you can imagine has been put in the schoolhouse. And that's just not sustainable. So I think the schools are part of a solution and I think they're doing their part certainly to end the um, school to prison pipeline that so many of our children find themselves in. Uh, I think that as a society though, we have a ways to go to understand that, you know, what happens seven hours a day is not gonna overcome 17. I did a, a bit of quick math here, and I'm certainly not a math guy, so please don't check my math. Um, but in a calendar year, there are 10,460 hours, okay, total. In terms of and, and, and that may be wrong, so again, don't check me. Um, but in terms of the hours that kids spend in school, that's seven hours a day, roughly about 180 days a year, that's about 1,260 hours. So less than 10%, or a little less than, a little over 10% of a kid's time is spent in school. So that means almost 90% is out of school and beyond the control. So the schools are in a position um, where for the last probably 50 years, since the 1960s, have been expected uh, to fulfill all these other functions that society at large is not filling. So for instance, it's, it's very good that you know a child in CMS, um, all children have access to free breakfast, um, regardless of income, and then certainly there's a robust free and reduced lunch program. But what happens to those kids when they leave school? Um, a few years ago, I ran into uh, a, a woman uh, at a political event, and she was telling me that her situation, she had three jobs, uh, two boys, nine and seven, who were at home by themselves most of the time. But she had to make a decision, and it was January, and the January wasn't as warm as the past one that we had, uh, where she was gonna have to decide, you know, whether to have electricity or water in a given month. So if a kid is bringing that to school, 
you know, you can have, you know, some of the teachers at Hogwarts uh, from the Harry Potter series in the classroom, and you're not going to be able to move the needle. So, sorry for the long answer, but I think the school district is, is not doing all it can, but certainly moving toward uh, doing what it can, but we need to recognize what the limits are uh, for school districts and, and that this is a problem that's intertwined. Uh, and I haven't touched on the health care piece, but, but that's part of it as well. So I'll, I'll be quiet and let somebody else talk. <laughs> we have a stack of health care questions. Yeah. We'll be back. <laughs> Thank you. Let's move on to policing a little bit. I have a stack of policing questions. I'll try to ask you. So I'll ask this one, um, maybe two together, because it reminds me of our recent discussions in the city around uh, the exclusionary zone. So is it considered biased for a higher police presence in high crime areas that have a high minority population? Is it considered discriminatory? Should it be? How should we police communities in urban areas? And then what approaches is CMPB taking now? First of all, I'm old, so you're gonna have to repeat that again in a few seconds, but um, I'll, try to be, I'll try to be as brief as I can because I realize you have a, a lot of questions. Um, you know, it, it can be looked at a lot of different ways. I mean, obviously, there's gonna be more police presence in areas where we have more crime. Unfortunately, um, the areas that we have more crime typically are our African-American communities. These are the people that are calling in more often. So you will have a higher police presence in those areas. And then the, re the reality of it is, when we're not there, then they call and say, we're, we're not there. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. And we, when we're there, people are upset. When we're not there, people are upset. But um, you will see a higher police presence in areas where we consider to have more violent crime. Um, the exclusionary zone, and do we consider it to be biased? I think it depends on what your reason for being there. I mean, there are some people and some officers that like to be in certain areas because they're looking for something to do. I think when you're not there for the right reason, then absolutely it can be, you know, you're there and it's a bias and then you want to be somewhere where you think you can find something. I think that's where you run into the issues. If you are there because we have calls for service, because we have high violent crime, because the community has been asking us to come, then that's different. So, but it's so um, subjective. And I think that's part of the problem is that it's so subjective until we try our best to pick the best of the best. But policing is like any other job. I mean, you're gonna have the good, you're gonna have the bad, and, and, and I hope that we only have a few bad apples. But the reality of it is, is that we are where the crime is, and a lot of times that's in the African-American communities. What's the other? Thing? What approaches have been implemented to address bias? Well, and I do want to follow up on something with the, with the. What approaches have been implemented to address bias? So we at the police department, we also are taking the race manually, um, the, um, the dismantling and racism classes. I'm a part of RMJJ, the Race Matters for Juvenile Justice, and we have been putting our command staff through that training. And I will be very honest with everybody in here, it has been a struggle. Um, people do not like going to classes where they think um, that someone's telling them that they are racist, which that's not what the class is about, but we've struggled with that. I think most people know police departments, for the most part, are primarily Caucasian male-run organizations. So when you end up in organizations like that, it takes a lot of work to try to bring people together to say that we have issues that you may not understand because you haven't been there, you don't understand it, you weren't raised that way, you have not had to deal with the same issues. And so it's very hard sometimes to get that mindset. We are working on it. But one of the things that we're doing, I think that is probably the best thing is working with the school system um, through school pathways. And that is we developed a diversion program in January of 2013. Because what we noticed was we were in a meeting and, and I was you know, not paying attention, which sometimes I do. And they asked the question and they said, well, how do our kids get into the system? And you know, I was looking down, I was writing and it was like really quiet. And so I figured I probably should look up, I had missed something. And everybody was looking at me and I was like, me for and, and you know it just it hit and it was like wow we're the ones putting the kids in the system as in the school resource officers as in our police officers and the reality of it is most of our officers don't want to do that especially we're talking about I'm talking about juveniles right now and most of them don't want to do that however they don't have options 
And so we developed a diversion program in January of 2013. And now for your first time offense, for a first time focus act, we refer the kids to the juvenile, to our diversion program, and then they have an opportunity to attend the class, um, complete the class satisfactory, have some um, points of contact with their SRO, and then they're not put into the system. And so we had to develop that on our own. We got a grant, we did it ourselves, but all of these other small agencies, they don't have diversion programs, they don't have those options. When you see something happen in a school, the only option that a police officer has, if it's not something that the school should be handling, is arrest. And that's really the only option they have. And so we have to ensure that other agencies and police departments are looking for creative ways to be able to divert juveniles into help versus into arrest. Mr. Rashford, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the work of the Community Relations Committee generally and the areas in which you focus and how you involve the community in your work? Um, again, our organization is the Charlotte Mecklenburg Community Relations Committee and one way that you might describe us is that we're the city and the county's uh, race relations organization. Uh, there are many folk who question whether there's really a need for such an organization. Uh, I personally happen to believe uh, that, that, that we do and not just because I work there. Um, People who don't believe that uh, we should have such an organization, uh, many are of the belief that racism and discrimination is a thing of the past, and they don't take into account uh, implicit bias, which we've talked about talked about a little. But they they also don't take take into account the way that uh, racism and discrimination uh, manifests itself these days. Uh, over uh, 35 years of doing this work, I have found that um, uh, racism and discrimination is alive and, and, and quite well, and. Um, we don't see it because those who engage in it very often are very subtle and very sophisticated in the way that they carry out the discrimination and they engage in something that we call have a nice day racism or racism with a smile and a pat on the back. Uh, we administer the city and the county's fair housing laws which prohibit discrimination in housing practices and we may get a complaint that an apartment complex is discriminating against African Americans. And uh, so we will actually uh, set up a test to see if that's happening. We give a white person and a black person, we give them a script, which makes them essentially the same person, same job, same uh, credit, same credit, uh, same income. Uh, everything is, is, is identical. The only variable is skin color. And uh, we send the black tester in, and he's welcome with open arms. He's introduced to all of the staff, taken on a tour of the apartment complex, and he's welcomed by everybody. They give him uh, cookies and milk. They offer him, uh, he fills out all of the necessary paperwork. Uh, and you get business cards from each of the persons who are working at the apartment complex. However, at the end of his process, he is told, we don't have any vacancies that are available at this time. Uh, however, we would love to have you as a tenant, so we're gonna place your name on the waiting list. And so he places his name on the waiting list. He leaves and he's thinking, I've had a very good and positive experience here. As he's leaving, he literally passes the white tester who is coming in. The white tester comes in and gets the very same treatment that the black tester just got, except at the end of his process, the black tester is told, I mean the white tester is told, we have four, four or five vacancies that are immediately available, whom would you like to move in? Thus the term, have a nice day racism or racism with a smile and a pat on the back. And because the rest of us in here might not see it, we assume that racism and discrimination is a thing of the past. The other way it manifests itself is through something called linguistics profiling. And we actually had a case not too long ago uh, when an African-American female went by an apartment complex on a Sunday. She saw vacant units and thought, nice place to live, I'll write down the number and go to work tomorrow and call. So she goes to work on Monday, she calls the number she had written down the day before to inquire about the five or six vacant units that she had just seen at this apartment complex on Sunday, only to have the voice on the other end say, we don't have vacancies and we don't know what you're talking about. And so she says, okay, so she hangs up the phone and she goes to her white female coworker and she says, will you call this number and ask about apartments? The white female gets on the phone, speaks with the same person, asks about apartments and is immediately, immediately told, uh, yes, we have four or five vacancies. When would you like to come out and, and, and possibly consider renting? It was the contention of the African-American female that her voice was recognized as a black voice. That's the reason she was told no vacancies. We did a test, and sure enough, the black tester was told no vacancy, the white tester was told yes vacancy. When we confronted the ownership of the apartment with the evidence that we had gathered, including the test in our investigation, uh, we ended up, re, uh, uh, they ended up settling the, the complaint 
and the black female got the three bedroom apartment free of rent for uh, a, a year and she got a $35,000 cash settlement because if you do this and we catch you, we are going to take your money. <laughs> it's, it's just that one other quick thing in terms of uh, the work that we're doing, this is something that has been happening recently. You all uh, have heard a lot over the uh, past couple of weeks about the city's non-discrimination uh, 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 intentions to take up a, take up a non-discrimination ordinance, which would essentially, um, uh, in addition to the traditional protected classes of race, sex, religion, national origin, and color, will add uh, sexual orientation, um, gender identity, and gender expression as protected status here in Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, when it comes to uh, public accommodations, uh, vehicles for hire, and administration of contracts uh, that might be let uh, with, with the city of Charlotte. And uh, there has been a, uh, there's, some, there's some nasty people in Charlotte, some mean people in Charlotte on both ends of, of, uh, of, of, of this argument. And uh, we've had to deal with uh, uh, both ends uh, over the past several weeks. But this past Monday, we had a uh, community forum in which we invited all sides of this particular argument to sit down in the room, to hear what the ordinance will actually entail, to hear from four actors, two who were in support uh, of the ordinance, two who were against the ordinance, and then they were allowed to circle up in the groups of uh, eight to ten to have uh, 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 dialogues or conversations. And we had like we had almost 300 people to show up, so we had like 30 something odd groups of t uh, eight to ten people. Uh, and these were people who uh, are very religious and are against uh, uh, transgender and, and sexual and, and, and sexual orientation, the whole gamut, and people who were in fact transgender or gay, uh, many for the first time sitting down face to face, knee to knee, having a conversation about this ordinance and, and how it might impact you personally and how it might impact your family. And one of the fears that uh, we found out that people had before they came to the meeting is that uh, many people on the trans side and many people on the religious right side, uh, over the over the years and uh, over the years had uh, had either demonized or dehumanized the other side, and one of the fears that we found out that they had was that they were afraid to sit down face to face with someone where you're literally close enough that your knees are touching because they might look up and see that on the other side of that conversation is another human being, and that would not comport with what they have always thought about these folks. But it was really cool. People did not scream and holler at each other, uh, and they had conversations. I don't know if we changed many minds, but we did get people to start looking at this in a very different way. So uh, and all of this to say that part of our job is to promote community harmony by uh, having the difficult conversations uh, um, uh, around issues in Charlotte uh, that might tend to divide us. from a lot of different areas and I know you work with our immigrant brothers and sisters. Tell us, are there particular issues of disparity within that community that we should be aware of and that you are addressing? Or are we saying the same things? You to the black community? The immigrant community. As it relates to me. Yeah. Well, I, everything that's been said actually resonates with me because, um, I mean, the, the difference is that the cultures are different, so we look different, you know, whether or not we wear hijab, whether or not we, you know, we uh, look slightly different. And, and it is clearly what was just said, that it's a matter of not recognizing a human being on the other side. I mean, the, um, the, I think we failed to recognize that this is a nation of immigrants, and whether or not uh, your ancestors come back 100 years or 120 years, 200 years, it's really not, you know, they all, most of them will be, you could trace your inheritance to your, to your family to somewhere from the Mayflower forward. Because um, there are very few uh, Native Americans and those we managed to put in limited areas of the United States. So it's just that the new immigrants will find that I guess the Statue of Liberty has its arms closed, and then we find them, they flows with them. Um, most of them are now brown in color. Um, it, they differ from the, um, the, you know, the Europeans that came in at that time, which also, you know, as time comes in, you know, people encounter obstacles. And um, they always, you know, the Irish were not liked at one point, but now the Irish are running the country. You know, the, uh, the Japanese, the, the Chinese, the, 
I guess it's human nature to dislike others that we that we they are not like each other, that they're not like us. So I think that uh, we do encounter those, and we encounter uh, clearly if we have a language barrier, then it's going to become an issue in a hurry. Um, you know, I know that I, I'm, as I was thinking of what to say in this, in this uh, uh, today, I was thinking, uh, going back to all the times that I, that I encounter microaggressions, uh, and you know, it, it's kind of difficult to to feel that you have to kind of justify, like I said earlier, the fact that you exist, that you're the fact that you, you belong here. Um, but you know, the, the recent arrival has more difficulty because the language barrier is there, and they're unable to articulate any one point. So they deal with the fact that they look different, coupled with the language barrier, then it becomes an issue. And it, it, you know, ultimately, we all want to, I mean, they may tell you, why don't you speak English? Well, you know, my parents were here for 40 years, and they never got it. I mean, but I don't, it's not because they didn't attempt. I mean, people, you, know, you want to come here to succeed. You know, whenever, you know, we, we always point the finger to immigrants. Well, you know, they're coming to take our jobs. I don't know if that's accurate, you know, in, in fact, or that they're lazy. I always felt if we were lazy, we would stay home. <laughs> <laughs> it was really very difficult to come to a different culture where you don't speak the language. And then, you know, you see people who are, in fact, uh, you know, have a medical degree, an accounting degree, and they're driving a, a cab. You know, they don't want to be there. But you know, they, they are, you know, again, if it's easier to just stay home, and then you don't have to negotiate all the obstacles, because really adapting into society is not, it's not an easy task. But you know, we all attempt it. You know, and then we are more successful. Some are successful, not so much. And I don't think what we're looking for is to melt into the society, because in New York City is the melting pot, right? But it never melted because you, there are common structures in, where all the Germans uh, are together, the Irish are together, the Italians, even the, the, the Latino community is divided in its own countries. So we, I don't think the idea would be to allow us to retain our heritage, you know, our cultural heritage, while adapting to the, to the environment. So I think we encounter it. It's a, it, you know, it's a, you know, it's interesting because you know, it's always where are you in the in the section, right? If you're the one with the authority to grant. The, uh, the the apartment, then you you know whether you're a black person looking into a you know a Salvadorian, then their role changes. And again, it's interesting how humans like to oh wait no now I'm in authority stage so I can actually deny you that apartment not because you're black because you're not because the person is black but because you're a foreigner. So I think that you know to some degree it is you know it, we do deal with the nice racism you know that was an incredible uh, I mean because we encounter it all the time. But it's just that it's still affecting our makeup, of our culture. And I do think that's an important point that, um, and I, I may have made it earlier, that a lot of this isn't just black and white anymore. And I don't know if it ever has been. Um, we have brothers and sisters in our community of all hues, of all nationalities and ethnicities um, that are experiencing different things. And disparities are impacting many different groups within our community. Um, and I'm sure the Community Relations Committee um, doesn't just deal in black and white. And our police don't deal in just black and white, neither do our educational institutions, and especially as the makeup of our school system changes, um, or our healthcare organizations. Our community is changing, and with that, so do some of the uh, biases that we now have to deal with and be aware of and address. So talk a little bit about healthcare, Mr. Bath, if you don't mind. I know you spent some of your career there. Um, can you share with us, and you alluded to it earlier, so the disparities in healthcare, where are there issues and are there solutions that are being uh, undertaken at this point? Sure. I mean, the, the, the biggest fissure in healthcare um, revolves around payment. So there are four classes of payers in healthcare. Uh, you have private insurance and Medicare, which are the gold standard. Uh, then you have Medicaid, which is a clear rung below the other two. And then you have what we call self-pay. And that is a fancy way of saying people who don't have the ability to pay, who cannot afford private insurance, make too much money or have too many assets for Medicaid, um, and so are caught in that hole. Um, that creates a disparity, um, at least as I've seen it, that translates to racial lines, because most of the individuals who cannot afford to pay are 
African American or Latino um, <coughs> immigrants, new immigrants to the country. Uh, and so the type of care that they receive uh, is lesser than the type of care that those with higher levels of insurance receive. Um, and it's a matter of access. So it's not, there's not an intentional structure in most places that says, you know, this door is for Medicare and private pay, and this door is for self-pay and Medicaid. The way it manifests itself is that folks without care seek out care in emergency rooms. Um, and under a law that some of you may have studied uh, with the acronym EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, if you come to an emergency room, they have to check and make sure, uh, well, they have to check and see if you have an emergency, a defined emergency. And if you do, they have to stabilize. So many folks go to emergency rooms and try to use emergency rooms as a form of primary care. Problem with that is they are the, emergency rooms are the least efficient and least effective place to do that because they're there to treat short-term emergencies until somebody, until someone with more time and, and additional resources can treat uh, the underlying symptoms. Uh, so folks who don't have uh, Medicare or private insurance don't get to go to that next level. They're stuck there, and so they end up being uh, sicker. <clears throat> they end up with the huge bills, because you still have to pay for that treatment you receive in the emergency room. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of a vicious cycle. Um, I think one of the biggest improved, well, the biggest innovation in healthcare since, healthcare payment since Medicare and Medicaid was the Affordable Care Act. Um, and, and the main thing that the Affordable Care Act has done is it has given people who did not have access to insurance, working people who made too much for Medicaid, made too little for private insurance, it's not only given them access to insurance, but it's given them a minimum standard to expect. So you don't have, well you still have some, but you used to have these insurance scams where you could pay for insurance on a monthly basis and it would be affordable, but it would never pay for anything if you got sick. Um, the Affordable Care Act has taken not taken that totally off the table, but has introduced, you know, it has has introduced private insurance so that folks can get that next level of access. So I think, you know, the payer mix is the big breakdown, um, the big dividing line in healthcare, it translates along racial lines. Um, we're moving, in, in my opinion, and this is just me speaking, I don't think that we will ever reach equity in our healthcare system until we have a single payer system. Um, and and I, didn't, I, didn't do it, I didn't do it for, <laughs> it, didn't do it for any applause, but just the way that we pay for healthcare and the way we pay for equipment and the way we pay for physicians, um, <coughs> You know, it, it's a perfect reflection of the market, and it operates like a market. And so, if we think healthcare is a fundamental right, we're going to have to change the way we think and the way we pay for healthcare. When I was one of the things I did, and I'll say this and be quiet, one of the things I did when I uh, worked in healthcare is I drafted for a while contracts, employment contracts for physicians. Some of those employment contracts I drafted were seven figures. Seven figures. Now, I'm not talking about plastic surgeons. I'm talking about folks who would treat you for ser for things. You know, I don't want to call them out, but I will. Urologists, um, gastrointestinal specialists. And that money has to come from somewhere to pay those doctors. And if you don't pay them here, guess what? They can go somewhere else. And if you don't, and then the cycle is, so if you don't have the best access to care, <laughs> your hospital gets that reputation, and then none of us will be going to that hospital because it is a bad hospital. So payment is really the, the area where we have to make some 
additional headway. Should that surprise anybody else or just me? Um, you know, I looked at the questions and we are down to about 10 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to ask, I think, the question I think reflective of this generation, what can we do now to address some of these issues? And particularly, we have a room so full of future lawyers. What can they do now in the next few years, beginning of their career, to help address some of the issues we've talked about today? Uh, wow, that, what are you all going to do? Uh, I think um, for, for all of the young folk in here, and I, I see all young folk in here, uh, I think um, you all uh, need to continue doing some of the things that you're doing right now. You all don't have, seem to have the same uh, hang-ups about, about race and ethnicity that uh, folk from my generation uh, actually have. Uh, you all are a little more progressive in your thinking. Uh, you're a little more progressive in the in the friendships and the relationships that you're actually forming. Uh, and um, I think um, that the country is starting to recognize that uh, that there has that there's, there's a subtle change. And uh, I, got, I sort of got some sense of this just uh, the other night watching total television. And um, I had seen several programs, and, and um, I'm, I'm a commercial, I like commercials. I saw several commercials. Uh, that caused me to think when I go to work tomorrow, I'm going to call a staff meeting to see if I'm going crazy or did I see what I actually saw. And uh, what I actually saw on television and with regards to commercials, I was amazed at the number of interracial couples that they have in the TV commercials these days. And um, I, re I recall a time uh, if you were a company in this country, you ran an interracial com uh, commercial, uh, pardon my language, but your ass was out of business the next day. <laughs> You know, folk just were not going to put up with it. And just the fact uh, that you have a lot of people that are starting to, to do this now uh, says to me that um, uh, there's not that fear that, uh, that, that, uh, that businesses used to have about uh, having such commercials on TV and uh, advertising their products. And I think that has to do that, uh, with the fact that they recognize that you folk uh, in law school and about to graduate and get good jobs making tons of money and they want to separate you from your money by having you to buy their products and they know that you don't mind an uh, interracial couple uh, uh, promoting the product on TV. I guess I'll say real quick, um, one of the things that I would tell you all to do is to stay involved in organizations that um, promote the mobility of, of the areas that you see that we struggle in. Um, if it's not a race matters for juvenile justice, you know, I don't know what other organizations that, you know, that you may be interested in, but organizations that keep that information on the forefront, because I always tell people it's not about justice, and I always say it's not about just us, the justice part of that is that when you all get out here and you get into your jobs and you have to, when you're looking to make a change, you have to make sure that you understand why people are in the situations they're in. You have to have empathy, you have to have compassion, you have to remember where people came from and you'll be in those situations where you have to make decisions and you have to think about, you know, are there services that I can provide? Are there ways for me to not impact this family in the way that I can? Obviously, sometimes that's not the case, but in what you do and whatever you decide to do, whether it's, you know, you know, whether it's criminal law or, or um, you know, any kind of law, real estate law, whatever it is, but just make sure that, that you keep an eye out for those type things. I think what happens is it kind of gets behind us at some point and we don't think about it. I think you have to be careful with people that you connect with. You have to make sure that, and I, I'm very honest with you, their soul is right. You have to make sure that the people that you connect yourself to, that they care about what they're doing, they care about people, they care about why things are happening to people. And you have to get involved in organizations to understand historical things. Everything is not black and white, but there are a lot of economic things, there are a lot of things that have occurred, and there are a lot of things that continue to occur, as, as Willie um, alluded to, that we have to make sure that we stay on top of. And you all are the people that can do that. And you just have to stay plugged in and make sure you keep your eyes open and question things. When things Things don't look right ask why you know ask why is it that way get people to explain it to you you are those people I think that the key is not to tolerate injustice and that's basically it I mean you you, you know you're, you're in law school you're given the tools uh, to essentially make sure that to, to just keep in mind that justice is your goal and the law is the tool that's gonna get you there and and that's basically it, I and mean, I think you're going to, you're being trained if you're here uh, to, uh, with good professors, you're giving it the, uh, the equivalent of uh, 
a weapon, and I always said, you know, my weapon, I'm coming in with my weapons, what is it, the law? And, and that's it, use it, and use it to make sure that it, you achieve justice. Um, you know, regardless of where you are in your class, where you are, where you're getting out from, ultimately you're gonna have a license that allows you to represent individuals. And then, you know, again, once you have that license, it doesn't matter the person in front of you, I mean, on the other side is, from the top law school or from the bottom law school, it's still as an individual with a, with a point. And then, provided that you trust in yourself and make sure that you read thoroughly the law and, and you, you believe in the system itself, then you use those tools to achieve justice. And I think that you could never forget that. You could never forget you're a lawyer, never forget that you're being given the tools to achieve that justice. And then, you know, uh, ultimately you'll be successful because fortunately we have a system that allows appellate. So if you somehow in the trial level you don't achieve what you're looking for, though uh, it was the right, the right outcome would be for you to win, you go to the next level and pursue it. Eventually, uh, the woods of justice are slow, but they get there eventually. So I think that, you know, uh, just don't forget that and, and use your, your, your knowledge. I would say the most important thing is use your critical thinking skills. Don't be afraid of facts. Don't be, af don't be afraid that the end point might not be the one you thought of when you started the journey. Use your critical thinking skills. Don't just accept things because somebody tells you that that's what it is. Um, also say, use your access. You, know, you will practice law, you will have access to people who can make decisions on policies that affect the things that we've talked about here today. They're going to ask you about things well outside the law because all of you are bright and you're capable and <laughs> there's a shortage of folks uh, out there, not, not that are bright and capable, but that will actually, um, that, who are using their critical thinking skills and who will tell people the truth um, as you see it. Uh, so don't be afraid to think and definitely use your access that you will have to affect policy because there's a great, I can tell you, there's a great opportunity to do that. What I, what I can do to cause you to change is to model the behavior that I would like to see you engage in in hopes that you see that as a good thing and then you empower yourself and you make the decision to change yourself. So be a change agent by modeling the behavior, the right behavior that you want to see the rest of us engage in. <laughs> Maybe two questions. Let's see what we can do in five minutes. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, it, it's been important to me. I have two daughters that are 13 and 15, and it's been important to me that they be in schools that have racial and social economic uh, diversity. Um, and, and your point about you know seeing some change on TV and, and the need to understand people's circumstances. And I mean, is that uh, we're going through student looking at our student assignment now in CMS is, I mean, is, is the idea that getting, you know, we, should, we should have mechanisms in our community to try to get people of different backgrounds together useful and helpful for addressing the implicit things that people may not, like your cost, for example, even know they're doing? It absolutely is. Um, but I think one thing that, and this is critical thinking again, um, you know, the schools, I, I went to school here in Charlotte Mecklenburg during the 80s, early 90s, um, and I was bused. And so every school I went to was perfectly balanced between black and white. Uh, but that was an artificial construct uh, because it was, at the end of the day, we went back to our neighborhoods which weren't balanced. So in order to get lasting change, you know, the school district or whatever you call it, one aspect of this, you can affect something just on the front end. But to get lasting change, we're going to have to have changes in housing policy. We're going to have to have all of these actors acting to get all these governmental entities acting together and individuals acting together. But I think that's absolutely critical um, to, to making sure that we have equal schools and equal opportunities. If, if I might add to uh, uh, what Mr. Ballard has said, uh, uh, it is also about accountability. I, I believe that we're going to change the racial and ethnic dynamic in this country. White people have to hold white people accountable. 
Black people have to hold black people accountable. Hispanic Latinos need to hold Hispanic Latinos accountable. Uh, it means forming uh, relationships with folk who don't, who don't look like you. Uh, it has been interesting to me over 35 years of doing the work that I've done uh, to uh, puzzle as to why black folk and white folk can't sit down and have an honest, substantive dialogue around race. And uh, years ago, we would get groups of black folk and white folk together, and we'd throw them in a room and say, okay, you guys have an honest dialogue on race, only to realize that later on, those folk thought that we were crazy. <laughs> and, and what we realized over time is that in order for blacks and whites and Hispanics, or any racial or ethnic group to have uh, that dialogue with one another, you have to have relationships first. You have to know each other and like each other because the relationship will save you. So for instance, um, as a black man, if I'm having a, uh, a conversation about race with another white male and we don't know each other, if one of us says something out of the way, it could get ugly and we're going to be in the parking lot and it's not going to turn out good. <laughs> uh, however, if we know each other first and we have that relationship and we have that same conversation, while we may not agree, uh, we will finish the conversation and at the end of the conversation, uh, I won't feel any need to demonize him. He won't feel any need to demonize me, and our, our relationship continues. So it really does boil down to, to, to having those relationships. And one of the interesting things I've always said to groups of blacks and whites and Hispanics who, who ventured to have the conversation is that at the end of the conversation, I asked them to look out the window, and guess what? The world did not come to an end. <laughs> You know, many of you I know come to Charlotte Law and they tend to stay in Charlotte and make it your home. And so being that as it is, and I know law school is hard and you're focused on studying, you still have to be engaged in the community, especially when things are happening that have long-term impact. And so for those of you who intend to make this your home and have families here, schools will be important. For those of you who have businesses and law firms here, your schools will be important. And so I ask that you now consider, even though you don't have children in the system yet, the question that she asked, what is important to you? when it comes to how a school system looks. And as you think about that, I invite you to take the survey that the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education now has on its website that is asking that very question, the exact same question she posed. What is important to you with respect to our schools? How would you rank these things? I took it, it took 10 minutes. The Council of Children's Rights also has a posted survey. It's a shorter one, asks some very general questions, but it's a policy organization that works collaboratively, most times, with the school district to address issues impacting children. And so as you think about these questions, as you think about making Charlotte your home, as you wrestle with disparities in the city, know that you are a part of the conversation. You're invited. You're entitled to be a part of that. And I invite you to be engaged in those things. There are people here in this room, the people on this panel, who want you to be involved. Go ahead, step up. I'm stopping you. You're here. This is the time to create relationships. Let's get started. Let's work together. Question? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is for you, Officer Foster and Professor Nunez. Um, the case that, the Hernandez case, it's more of an immigration kind of type issue that's about hopefully going to be granted certiorari by the Supreme Court pretty soon about the Border Patrol officer who shot across the border, um, the 15 year old who now the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has I'm granted. I'm glad you so, okay, we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's granted the the now dead child, his family was granted Fifth Amendment rights, U.S. Constitution Fifth Amendment rights. Do you see our country moving towards granting foreign nationals um, uh, our constitutional rights, as well as looking holding those Border Patrol officers a little more responsible? What does that look like in the future, and what kind of changes are we going to see down that road? Well, in that case, I mean, the, the, the child was outside of the United States, right? So that very nice difference because we, you know, if you are within the four corners of the United States, you are entitled to all those rights. Uh, you know, there, where that takes place, you know, in, in there, uh, there are kind of variations of that, but that's, that was a unique factor where essentially a border patrol kind of felt threatened by a couple of rocks, like, uh, by rocks, although there was a fence between them and, and killed somebody else. Uh, so, um, you know, we'll, I mean, I wish I knew what the Supreme Court thought, you know, and it's usually, I guess, Kennedy who makes the decisions, I'm not really sure, but um, we'll find out. I mean, but just want to make sure that we do have our rights, I mean, while we, citizens or non-citizens, provided that we're in the four corners of the United States. So, I'm not sure that answered your question. Yeah, it was just the fact that he was already 
he's a non-citizen and granted a Fifth Amendment right, I was like, kind of, do you think that more rights are going to start being applied to foreign nationals? I guess was more a more direct question. For U.S. Well, again, that, that, I think the difference in that case when right, uh, it, it happens of where it took place, okay. and just where that person was when 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 it was shot. So whether or not that extends beyond the you know, beyond the. World. I, I know you you did not ask me that question, and I'm not a, uh, an immigration lawyer. Don't know much about those things, but but I do have common sense, and uh, my common sense tells me that um, while we may not uh, comport those rights to all uh, uh, folk who may not be citizens of this country, I think uh, you handle that on a case by case basis, and and if in this particular case you consider the egregious nature of what happened, a 15 year old child was killed, and uh, no one in this country should be allowed to hide behind citizenship or the failure uh, to temporarily grant uh, some some of our status to a dead child, uh, no one should be allowed to get away with murder uh, as, as uh, uh, simply because of that. Well, I thank you for your active participation. I thank our panelists. Um, I, we have a small break. We start again at the breakout sessions at 2.30. Uh, is there a law review rep in here to give direction about where those sessions are? Yeah, on board. board. On the board. Okay, I can see it. Thank you. So on the board, let's see the rooms for the next breakout sessions. If you would join me, thanking our panelists.